I have been Lutheran all my life. I've been a pastor for nine years. From the very time that I was born, all I have ever heard from my parents, my pastors, my Sunday school teachers, my seminary professors, and everyone else is that God loves me no matter what I do, that I do not have to earn that love or prove myself in any way. That's the only message that I have ever preached as a pastor. And yet, after all these years, I'm still baffled by how often I hear people doubt that. Oh, they would, wouldn't say that they doubt it, of course, but I hear it in their questions. I see it in their fears. They express concern when they are doubting what they've been taught to believe their whole lives. They worry that their loved ones who aren't Christian uh, might be going to hell. They have a hard time struggling and wrestling with how to accept someone whose religion or whose sexuality or gender identity doesn't fit with what they learned were correct. After all these years, I'm still occasionally surprised by how prolific that doubt is. I'm still surprised that I see it even in myself. After all that I have heard, all that I have seen, that I might still doubt the truth of that love. I still get frustrated with myself for not being the kind of Christian or the kind of pastor that I think I ought to be, that I think God wants me to be. I still get defensive when others, especially people that I love, turn away from the Christian faith to seek truth in other places. In my honest moments, I can admit to myself that all of that comes from the fear that maybe God's love isn't as simple or as universal and comprehensive as I say it is. We've all heard these verses today. For God so loved the world, but something in us causes us to doubt or to reject or to predicate that love on something else. We make that love contingent upon our belief of it or on moral action on our part or on good intention. But that's not what the story says. In spite of how many times we've heard it, we still wonder, how could God love the world? How could God love me? Nicodemus, the Pharisee, shows up today to talk to Jesus because Jesus has just trashed the temple. Nicodemus is understandably confused. This teacher who claims to be from God has now upended God's house. And so he wonders, if you are from God, why would you do this? In other words, he's asking, who is this God that you claim to be from? Jesus responds with some perplexing words about birth and wind and then explains with a story. God so loved the world, he says. This is Jesus' way of explaining to Nicodemus who God is. God cannot be known apart from love. Love is in God's character. Or to put a finer point on it, God is love. Love is is who God is. This is the truth to which our concept or our doctrine of Trinity bears witness. As I said earlier, Trinity Sunday is a celebration of the mystery of God who is one and yet also three. It's a feast day devoted to this nature of God. What Trinity helps us to see is that God cannot be known apart from relationship. In fact, God is relationship. God is love. We can't know the Father apart from the Son or apart from the Spirit. We can't know any of them except in relation to one another. Theologians sometimes describe Trinity like a dance in which the three twirl around so closely and so quickly that they soon become indistinguishable from one another. God is known primarily in fact, only in God's love 
for God's own self, in the Father's love for the Son's love for the Spirit. That love is intrinsic to who God is. Without that love, the very idea of God doesn't even make sense. But it doesn't stop there. When God created everything that is, the creator or the parent conceived of an idea. Each of those ideas came into existence as the word was spoken. It took on a life of its own as the breath entered into it. In other words, each and everything that exists is a piece of God, an idea that began in God and was given form by God and given life by God. Each and everything that is, animate and inanimate, is an expression of God. Mountains, forests, sunsets, bluebirds, butterflies, all of them reveal something about God, even tapeworms and tree slugs. They reveal something of God because they are all expressions of God's creativity, all manifestations of God's love. They all live or happen or have been formed within the creation that God has made. Because each and everything in creation is an expression of God, they are all united in God. And through God, they are united with one another. It's not that different from how the parent and the son and the spirit are united in divinity and yet also somehow separate. Trinity describes the unity and also the distinctness of the three. And that also describes the unity of God with a creation that is yet somehow distinct from God. This means that in loving God's creation... God is also loving God's own self. God loves each plant or animal or star or atom because each of those things is an expression of God's own self. Love is the recognition that God has of God's own self in each created thing. They are not God, and they are not God's, and neither is God those things But each of those things is in God, and God is in them. Confused yet? I know I am. But there's more. Because each and every created thing also, of course, includes us. St. Paul writes, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. St. John testifies to Jesus saying, As the Father abides in me, I abide in you. Beneath all of our complex motivations and flawed character traits, at the very core of our being, the life that animates us is the life of God, given by the Holy Spirit. The one who lives in us, our deepest, truest, inmost self, is Christ. And that is not an easy reality to accept, let alone understand. It's not what we see every day as people hurt and steal from and fear and abuse and betray one another. The reality that we see, the physical reality, suggests that this truth to which the evangelists and the apostles point is false or mistaken somehow. And we are inclined to trust it because we live, as Paul says, according to the flesh according to what we can see and hear and feel. We believe that ourselves, instead of being united with all the other creatures in God, actually stop at the limits of our flesh. We consider the biochemical processes of our cells to be the full extent of life. And so we hurt and steal and fear and abuse and betray in order to protect and to prolong that life. Such life, according to the flesh, is all about me. I think and I act and I live only for myself, whether to exalt myself or save myself or fulfill myself or comfort myself or punish myself. 
To live instead according to the Spirit is to see and to acknowledge and to trust the reality that we are not, in fact, separate and isolated from one another and from the rest of creation and from God, but that in God we are in union with all that is, with all people, all creatures, all creation. It is to trust that God is at the deepest core of who I am, the light that shines within me, the breath that gives me life, that God's love for me is identical with God's love for God's own self, that God loves me for the same reason that God loves, that the, that the parent loves the son, the son or that the spirit loves the parent. And so my love for you and your love for me are also identical with God's love for us and our love for God. And so this wild and crazy dance of the Trinity includes all of us and all creation. Life according to the Spirit means that knowing that you, whoever you are, wherever you are from, whatever you have done or not done, whatever you believe or don't believe, you are infinitely beloved by God because God recognizes God's own self in you. I really believe that this is what these stories are trying to say. But we will never believe that truth about ourselves until we can believe it about everyone else, including and perhaps especially about those people whom we dislike and distrust the most. God so loved the world, he says. There's something you need to know here. That when Jesus says world, he's not talking about creation in general or about the planet Earth. The word that he, refu- that he uses refers to all the powers and the forces and the systems that actively reject and resist God. He's talking about the darkness, as St. John might say, that blinds people to the light of God. He's talking about God's enemies, about the people of this age, this corrupt generation. For God so loved God's enemies that God became one of them in order to give them life to give them God's own life. Not to condemn the world, but to save it. That is the love that God has for us. The love, the kind of love that it is impossible for us to know among one another. Excuse me, the kind of love that is possible for us to know among one another. Love that actively seeks the benefit of that which it hates most, or which most hates it. If you're thinking that sounds impossible, apparently I am too. You're not alone. A little Freudian slip there. I wonder if even the saints and mystics on their best days are only able to manage this kind of love in fits and spurts. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, we say. And we are, after all, people of the flesh, born of the flesh, living according to the flesh. That doesn't mean that we're wrong or bad. It just means that we can't yet see the reality that God is dying to show us. There is no hell greater than the illusion of separation which we create for ourselves. The illusion in which we futilely compete against our very selves for what we already have. We can't help it. It's just the way we're born. But somehow, within that mystical dance of Trinity, a new possibility arises. Somehow, in this mysterious and infinite love, we are reborn over and over and over again. 
as the divine image of God within us puts that flesh to death and makes us something new, a creation born of the Spirit. How does that work? I have no idea. The wind blows where it will. All I know is that as I come to know the truth of this mystery more fully and more intimately, I can see and I can feel myself becoming more open, more loving, more like the spirit into which I am being reborn. St. John wrote that it's impossible for me to love God whom I have not seen when I cannot love a sibling whom I have seen. I wonder if I cannot even love my siblings until I'm able to love myself. Thankfully, in the mystery of the Trinity, love is multidirectional. The love of the people around me can help me love them and myself and God more fully. Because love is from God. God is love. Within the dance of Trinity, God is loving God ever more fully. And through that mystery, we are all a part of that mystical rebirth.